Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the afternoon sessions for day one of OSSA 2020. Um, just uh, let me check to see if there's any other new announcements. I don't believe there are. Just a reminder, um, add your Q&A to the um, questions on the right hand side or potentially the speakers might call for live questions. I haven't had a chance to talk to them about it. Um, and we will continue in a second. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Bianca Wirth and Yenny Tim discussing how to use machine, uh, how to use data and machine learning to improve your resilience to phishing and improve your education program. Hi everyone, how's it going? Uh, I think we're okay here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and excuse me, I have a little quirky voice today, of course, on the <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Always the way. Okay. Uh, just let me know if you can't see the, the screen. Yeni, you, you okay? Work. Yep, I'm okay. Okay, and everyone can see the screen okay? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so thank you very much everybody for attending the session today. Please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, we've got lots of content to get through, so hopefully we'll be able to impart some of our uh, research some of our um, tips and tricks on uh, phishing awareness uh, and education programs and machine learning and, and um, how to manage uh, data uh, in, in that way in, to report uh, on your phishing awareness programs. So um, I've got with me, I'm Bianca Worth, so I'm a director of cyber at KPMG and I got, I've got with me today uh, Dr. Yanni Tim. Yanni, would you like to just introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Yeni. I'm a senior lecturer from UNSW. Fantastic. Um, so we'll kick off with a little bit of an introduction to phishing awareness, then we'll move into uh, the research that we conducted around and around using machine learning to look at the data around phishing simulations. Uh, and then we'll um, end up the session with some tips and tricks. And like I said, feel free to ask as many questions as you like. Uh, we've got lots of content to get through, but we'll try to leave um, some time at the end for, for Q&A. So essentially, when we're looking at uh, the key elements of phishing awareness, there's three key areas that you want to look at. The first is um, ensuring the people that you're targeting have the requisite knowledge um, to change their ways. So this is teaching them about what they need to know um, about cybersecurity. The second area is the way that they think, and you'll see a little bit further on in the slides that we talk a little bit, touch on a little bit around the psychology of phishing. Um, so the thinking aspect is, is one critical element that you need to consider in the way that you educate and make people aware of um, phishing campaigns. And the third is that you want them to, the goal of every education awareness campaign in uh, security is to get people to take an action. You've got a call to action at the end of the campaign um, or at the end of a communication that you um, produce. So we want to make sure that there's a call to appropriate call to action. And in the case of phishing, it might be report the phishing um, email or suspected phishing email to XYZ, your SOC or the relevant team or person if you're a small organization. So some of the common challenges that we see around phishing simulations um, and education awareness in phishing is uh, generally a lack of evidence and risk-based approach. And by that, I mean, um, you know, actually looking at the data. And that's why we undertook this research project to be able to delve into the data and determine really why are people clicking on these phishing emails? What's making them do it? Um, and then obviously take a risk-based approach in terms of designing your phishing simulation or phishing education awareness program to um, target the appropriate levels of people, or appropriate groups, risk groups. And the reason for that is, you know, you may not have a lot of money in your uh, education campaign. And so therefore you need to target the higher risk groups. And they may be, you know, after you've gone through a risk assessment, they may be the people that, um, for example, work in finance, you know, they've got privileged access to transfer funds um, and they're often a, a high target. Um, or your executives, for example, or privileged access users, so administrators in your organization. Um, but broadly, you know, I'd recommend that you try to target everybody with uh, phishing education awareness, but how deep you go might be dependent on, um, you know, how much funds you actually have. 
So the second area is uh, generic email and education page templates. So often you'll, um, some of the tools out there, the tools that you can use for phishing simulations, uh, there's also paid tools, um, and they'll provide you know a set of templates that you can use. But the key thing is, um, and I'll kind of touch on this a little bit later, the key thing is keeping that information and the look and feel of it fresh. Um, and that's often a challenge for organizations because um, Unlike myself, in my previous role, I had a, a dedicated team around education and awareness. You may not have that. So, you know, having the time to actually develop, you know, fresh training every month or whatever the frequency is that you actually send your phishing simulations out um, can be quite a challenge. The third area is the education awareness team, um, potentially in larger, larger organizations where you've actually got a team working on this, um, working in silos. So um, it's really critical to make sure that you've got integration with um, other teams such as legal, for example. Um, they may want to review their email simulations before you send them out. Um, also, uh, especially around you know, some of the challenges that I've seen are copyright. Um, so people may want to use logos of actual companies. That's generally a, a no-no unless you've got their permission. Um, but also, you know, your internal communications team, if you're large enough to have one of those, um, they can be your best friend in helping you understand what other communications are coming out at the same time that may conflict um, with the phishing campaign that you're just about to run. Um, and the final area is the lack of measures. So it is hands down the top area that I get asked about, um, you know, whenever I talk about this topic is how do I measure? Um, the success of these campaigns. And we're a little bit lucky with some of the simulation um, tool sets in that we can, um, we've got the tool sets there, they give us a fair bit of data so we can measure the impacts more easily than a lot of other education and awareness campaigns that you might run. But I'll, I'll touch on that a bit further down in the presentation around metrics and the types of metrics that there are. So I'll hand over at this point to Yanni and she'll take us through the data and machine learning side of things. Thank you, Bianca. So I'll just talk about how data and machine learning can play a part in addressing some of those challenges that Bianca has just mentioned about. So I would like to think about um, data and machine learning as a supporting tool to help us make better decisions um, you know, with more confidence. And when you want to improve, let's say, phishing resilience, data can help you to develop understanding about what is happening in your organization and you could uncover patterns and make customized decisions. For example, um, like Bianca has just said, we could understand you know, behaviors of certain user groups, and then we could show them customized content, such as educational landing pages. And data also allows us to you know, better define and monitor the progress and impact of our phishing campaigns, and it allows us to present the right information to the right audience. So those are the things that uh, we will talk about today. We will walk you through some of the things we have done using data and machine learning in shaping a cybersecurity education program. And at a higher level, we also wanted to discuss some lessons learned about the role of machine learning and data, including what they can and can't do for you, and what you can do to better harness data and machine learning to support your work. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So let's start with some quick background. The results and lessons that you're seeing in this presentation are based on a collaboration between a large insurance company and a team of researchers from UNSW. We started the collaboration uh, with a goal to develop a data-inspired approach to improve phishing resilience within the company and to shape the education program. And you might be wondering, what do we need for a collaboration like this? So first of all, we need data, lots of data. And um, in this project, we mainly drew on um, the phishing campaign data, but also um, contextual data, which is actually just domain knowledge of the practitioners like Bianca within the organization. And we collect um, the contextual data through interviews and a lot of uh, discussions. So the image on the right is a bit small, but you should be able to see um, that uh, it's basically the life of a data scientist. And I found that really relatable and very useful for me to walk you through the process. So first of all, um, what I want to emphasize is that 
a lot of the data analytics projects actually involve lots and lots of data cleaning. And the building of machine learning models may actually just be a small part of such a project. So asking the right question actually and tell, telling the right stories with the outcomes are much more important. Um, next slide, please. Okay, now that we have an understanding on the overall process and what it entails, let's just get to a real quick machine learning 101. But before I start, it is important to note that um, we did a lot of um, descriptive analysis in this project. In fact, I would say the majority of our analysis are descriptive and we'll talk more about that later. But we also leveraged on some predictive modeling to inform um, the phishing campaign strategies. So the first step of um, predictive analysis is really to go back to basic. And by this, I mean asking what is the problem? So asking the right question is really important because it guides every subsequent decision we are going to make. For example, what models we are going to use and build and what results we can get. So um, in the context of phishing campaigns, what we found from this research project was that um, a majority of the questions we were interested in were classification problems. So classification problems are problems that have discrete value outcomes. For example, clicking on a phishing email or not clicking on one are discrete outcomes. There is no middle ground where users kind of click on the email, but not really. So we can teach computers to perform classifications. And I think the process is kind of similar to how we teach a child to recognize maybe an animal that they have not seen before. So let's say we show a child pictures of cats and we show them pictures of other animals. When they look at a cat picture, we'll say cat. And when they are looking at pictures that aren't cats, we will say no. And after a few rounds, the child will be able to classify a new picture as a cat or not a cat. So this is a highly simplified example of supervised learning. And there are a lot of ways to perform classifications in machine learning. I will just quickly talk about two models today. The first is the decision tree. And decision tree is something we are quite familiar with because we actually rely on it a lot when making all sorts of decisions every day. So in the context of machine learning, what does a decision tree do? Um, put it simply, it helps you understand the path of a decision. And then we also have a K nearest neighbors classifier here, um, a not so simple name, but actually it's a very simple concept. So this algorithm assumes that um, similar things are near to each other. As you can see from the diagram, um, the different colors represents a sort of different clusters classified as similar. So this classifier is very useful for recommendation systems and also um, people use it to identify um, outliers such as unusual um, credit card usage behaviors and fraud. So in addition to classification, there are also regression problems. The output variable in a regression problem is numerical as opposed to discrete. So regression models is often used to predict uh, future prices and revenue, for example. Next, please. Thank you. So in this project, we settle for decision tree models because they are more intuitive and, and we find that they are much more helpful for business users to actually use. So we use decision trees to identify our features that have predictive power for the target variables that we are interested in. So what does that actually mean? If we look at the diagram in the slide, um, it's a simplified example, but in this case, we can see that the target variable that we are interested in is whether the user has clicked on the link in a phishing email or not. And the answer is either yes or no. So it is a classification problem. And we want to know what features or factors can be used to predict if users will click on a link or not. And in this tree, you can see that um, one of the first feature that was shown as a predictor is actually the using mobile feature. And we can see that users are more likely to click on a phishing email if they were reading it from their mobile device. And the next predictor is the contractor feature. 
users with a role labeled as contractor were more likely to click on phishing emails. So these are very useful insights because it can help us to make better decisions. For example, we can make sure that um, our awareness training is being rolled out to contractors and we can create educational pieces that inform employees about reading emails from mobile devices. Next. So, um, but I also wanted to emphasize that predictive models are not going to guarantee uh, perfect decisions. So there are many challenges in doing predictive models. And uh, one key challenge I want to talk about today very quickly is the requirement on data quality. And requirement on data quality includes um, the historical data that we need to train the models, as well as the new data that we need to make new decisions. So in, when working with real live data sets, there's usually some missing value and some mislabeled fields and all that in the data set. And a very small variation in data can actually change the decision tree or produce a biased tree. And this challenges the um, trustworthiness of the model, including the perceived trustworthiness for the business users. So the key lesson we have learned from these challenges is the power of combining data machine learning and rich contextual understanding from the insiders in the organization to drive more actionable insights. So for a researcher like myself, I need insights from you know, uh, practitioners who are on the ground to understand data points and understand the results of it. So I'll pass it back to Bianca to talk about some of the insights that she has uh, related to the contextual understanding. Sure. So, um, so as Yeni mentioned, um, we actually took uh, two years of data um, for this project and we did have a number of those different problems. You know, we had fields mislabeled. So I guess if you're going to go about um, collecting or un um, undertaking a similar sort of project, um, it's critical to make sure that number one, you've thought about when you first set up um, the data that you've got the right fields being captured um, in the phishing simulation software, for example. A lot of the tools allow you to upload uh, various fields against each of the users, or you can bring that data out and then match it up um, with the contextual information after uh, the simulations have been run. There are some challenges in doing that. For example, people may leave in the meantime and then um, the, the uh, matching data that you have later on may not exist for that for that user from the HR records, for example. So just a quick um, overview of why people uh, click. So in the research that we've undertaken and the practices that we've run um, in phishing simulations over an, a number of years, we've identified there's a number of different factors that you can see on the screen here. So I'll just go through a couple of these. Um, on the brain side of things, we've got the cognitive biases. So we've all got biases that exist um, in our, you know, in our brains. And uh, those are things that we actually have to recognize and understand and should be incorporated into education and awareness programs to help people understand the types of issues that can actually occur because of their biases when they're, say, reading a phishing email, for example. So um, cognitive biases essentially guide the way that you think. Um, I've got a couple of examples here. So for example, I've seen um, overconfidence biases and not pointing any fingers to IT or uh, cyber people, but there tend to be some overconfidence biases and that may be a false sense of um, skill or self-belief that they're perhaps not gonna be get caught out by a phishing email. Uh, then we've got availability heuristic, and that one is essentially, um, you know, performing actions based on what we already know. And that, for example, you might make a decision about opening email um, based on related events. A really good example of that is when we interviewed one of the, uh, a few of the people that were susceptible to a particular phishing campaign. And it was a phishing campaign around uh, postage. And the message essentially uh, was along the lines of, you've missed a parcel being delivered to your home. Now, uh, that's a fairly common phishing email. Um, you click on the link and it takes you off to some site, they'll grab your details, install software, whatever it does at the end. But um, the issue with that was we sent that out to say 12 and a half thousand people. 
Uh, and we're, we were pretty much taking the approach that a lot of um, hackers or social engineers take when they send out phishing emails, and that's the spray and pray approach. And that essentially means if I send it out to a large enough target audience, um, there's a likelihood that I'm at least going to get some people to click on those emails. Um, and we did. It was actually quite a popular uh, phishing email to send out. And when we interviewed some of those people, we found out that actually they were waiting at home for a package at that point in time. So it was very relevant to them. And that comes over to the time and timing side of things is that the relevance really plays a part in designing the, the phishing simulations and phishing camp, uh, education campaigns. Um, so that was uh, one example. Uh, the relationships that you have with people is also a critical factor. And a lot of the, you'll find that a lot of the education and awareness campaigns tend to target the technical uh, factors or the te technical awareness. For example, you know, look at the sender's email address, address. And is that sender really the, you know, do you know that person? Is it really the person that you should be expecting an email from, for example? So they really uh, focus on the design um, and the relationship side of things, but they may not take into account these other elements around the cognitive bias. Um, the curiosity one, for example, was a really interesting one because um, we had people click on a particular phishing uh, email. And when we said to them, why did you click on that phishing email? Um, and it would had been, you know, they had been a repeat offender. I don't like that word, but that was the, the classification. So, and their answer was, oh, I just wanted to see what the education awareness campaign looked like this week, this, this month. Ooh, okay, that's not exactly what we wanted you to do with phishing emails. Um, so there are errors that can occur when you're actually designing um, these phishing campaigns um, in making sure that you're not too enticing for people to, to be clicking on, on them as well, regardless of whether they think it's a simulation or not. Um, so there's also other elements like risk propensity, and that's just ingrained into people as well. So how, um, how likely are they to take risks? Um, and that can increase the factor of uh, clicking on phishing emails, for example. So some of the insights and improvements um, that we found through this program uh, was essentially as you're designing these simulations and um, education campaigns, is treated like a marketing campaign. So I've put the example of Norbert there. So in our campaign, we had a piece of software, that piece of software we could embed a add-in into Outlook. And that Outlook uh, add-in allowed people to quickly report suspected phishing emails. Um, we created a character for that icon, and that's and he was a little fish, and he was a fat little chubby purple fish, and his name was Norbert. Um, and then by the uh, time we had implemented the campaign and gone through multiple iterations of the simulations, everybody knew about Norbert. Even the uh, CEO's PA, the CEO himself. You know, a lot um, of people really align themselves to that marketing of here's Norbert, click on Norbert if you see a suspected um, phishing email. And it really raised up, um, I believe, the had an impact in contributing to the um, reporting statistics um, and the ability to be able to avoid the real phishing emails um, in the organization as well. Another element is skill diversity in your awareness team. So in our team, uh, you know, we had a graphic designer and animator who would design that for those fresh campaigns for us. We had um, a junior uh, cybersecurity specialist, for example, um, and a writer. So um, it's not always, uh, you know, really technical cybersecurity people that may be involved in these campaigns. If you bring in that sort of diversity, not only are you going to have diversity of thought and innovation around the types of campaigns that you can uh, use, but also diversity around, um, you know, um, the types of initiatives that you can take, how far you can extend your programs. You know, if you've got those skill sets in there, the sky's the limit, right? Um, another one is innovation and refreshing your branding. So an element that we worked on with the data set was around uh, developing a leaderboard to assigning points to people based on the successful uh, phishing simulation um, submissions that they reported, as well as correlating that data with real phishing reports as well. So if they recognized real phishing emails, being able to mash that up and provide them points, put them on the leaderboard, 
you know, have an annual prize for it, um, etc. Um, so defining the goal of each communication is really important as well. Uh, that just is best practice in terms of making sure that you're really clear about what it is that you want people to do, that call to action that I mentioned at the start. Um, and I've talked to a number of people around uh, phishing simulations and one of the elements uh, that tends to be sort of thrown about is um, sometimes people go out with the initial, with the thinking of we, we want to trick people into clicking, want to get as many people as possible clicking on this so that we can, and that's kind of not the, the goal of this. The goal is to make sure that when a real phishing email comes through, they know what to do, they can recognize it and they can report it through the right channels. So, um, you know, hiding the fact that you're going to send out a phishing simulation isn't necessarily the best um, approach to, to these types of campaigns. And that comes to the next point around being transparent and visible across the organization and getting executive buy-in for your program. Um, and then maybe, Yanni, do you want to touch on the data as insights to stakeholders? So I'll just quickly talk about um, insights around data. So I think one key thing we realized uh, when we worked on the project was really about how um, education or awareness team usually uh, would be the only unit in an organization shouldering um, you know, the responsibility of cultivating the cyber resilience. But when we have data, um, we can really make such process really transparent and visible. And um, just a small example in the project was that we developed visualizations um, and we customize it. So we have different dashboard views um, for different stakeholders from the executive level to the operational level. So in that case, it really shows um, different results and meaningful outcomes that different stakeholders wanted to see. So over to you, Bianca. Yeah, and, and that requires quite a bit of thought behind it in terms of getting the right metrics defined for displaying to those right uh, stakeholder groups as well. So, um, you know, the types of statistics that you might report to the board is not the types of same types of statistics or metrics that you're going to report to, you know, the um, IT or cyber operational team, for example. So that brings us on to metrics. So there's essentially two different types of metrics. There's primary metrics and secondary metrics, and I call the secondary metrics vanity metrics. So um, the primary metrics essentially prove that the user understands the education content training um, that you've delivered, and it has moved them towards an increased level of understanding. So those metrics are the hardest metrics to design in edu any education and awareness program. Um, because, for example, um, you know, it might be quite hard to design a metric that captures, you know, someone attended a course, um, how did they actually put that knowledge into practice, okay? You could give them a quiz, for example. Uh, with phishing simulations, um, what's the type of metric that you might have there? Well, it would be a mashup um, or a calculation of the, and, and the trends that you can see in the data that you've gathered over time around, you know, Phishing uh, resilience is going up. So phishing resilience is a measure of um, the number of people that report versus the number of people that click. Um, and that'd be sort of a good primary metric to have around a phishing simulation. Now, secondary metrics are me metrics that are really easy to come up with. Um, and they're the most frequent metrics that I see being used in programs that they measure that an action has been taken, but it doesn't measure that they've consumed or put that knowledge into practice. So a good example of a secondary metric for um, for example is you know website hits. Someone visit a web page. Okay, sure, they visited it, but did they really consume that knowledge? Did they just click on the link, have the page sitting there, not actually read the content? For example, how are you actually going to measure um, or get that primary metric that shows that they've consumed that knowledge. So they're the two types of metrics that you need to take into account. Now, I'm not saying secondary or venetary metrics are really bad. Um, they're definitely uh, supplement uh, what you have, but the prim primary metrics are definitely the ones that you want to define. And then when you come to design your dashboards and reporting around the data that you've gathered uh, and the analysis that you've performed, say, with machine learning or even manual analysis, if you don't have that capability, um, you know, you've got to be able to show those those primary metrics. Otherwise, you know, you'll start getting questions around, well, you know, what are we paying for here? Um, and should we continue to fund this? Um, so we we did say in the uh, the overview of this session that we'd give a quick um, 
and I want to leave some some time for questions, but we give a, a quick, you know, lessons learned around our university and business collaboration. Um, so for for a, from a business perspective, we found that collaborating with the university on this project, the, the benefits were fantastic. The type of knowledge that universities have in terms of the research knowledge, um, you generally can't find that uh, inside of a lot of organisations. So um, that was a massive benefit to us. But in establishing that type of relationship, you know, things like the contracts took time to negotiate. I think it took about you know um, six months or more. <laughs> so you need to have persistence uh, in developing these things. If you work for a large organisation, you collaborate with the university on this type of initiative. Um, you will also have to negotiate and show your lawyers or your legal team internally that um, it's a reasonable request to be sharing this IP. How are you going to secure the data um, if it's shared with them? Um, and we just came to compromises there in terms of how that would work. Also, um, making sure that we had an executive sponsor engaged who's interested. I mean, executive sponsors for any type of project is just, you know, you should be doing that. That's normal. And then, uh, you know, if you're doing a research project in collaboration with the university, you have to treat it like a normal project, assign a project manager, get SMEs involved, set up a schedule and a time frame, you know, define all those things and keep it going like a, a project. And sometimes that can be a challenge when you've got BAU, BAU work to undertake as well. Uh, Yeni, do you want to take us through some of the university lessons? Yeah, sure. So I'll be real quick because we have two, two minutes left. But from a researcher's or university's perspective, again, the collaboration is really a rewarding one. But in terms of uh, lessons learned, I think I would just quickly highlight uh, two key points, which I think are quite important. The first one, I think Bianca briefly talked about it as well. So uh, discuss about the expectations, the priorities, and how both parties actually see the project. So what this project means you know, to each party. That's very important because um, we wanted to make sure that the commitment, the expected outcomes, and the timelines are aligned. So uh, with an agreement established, my second point would be about growing the relationship. And I think this can be done in various ways. For example, um, regularly scheduled meetings is definitely something we need to do because you don't want to miss any blind spots or you, know, you want to seek feedback, especially early feedback in the process. And try, um, if possible, involve key stakeholders in the process, even though they might not be your initial point of contact. Because this is important to establish a shared understanding, keep the momentum going, and more importantly, I think, is to keep the key decision makers informed. So they might be the people who need to implement the solution later. And beyond just that research relationship, it act, we can actually grow it um, in you know, different ways as well. For example, um, including each other in relevant initiatives. Um, in UNSW, for example, we have educational programs that we connect practitioners with students. So that's a good way to deliver more benefits to both parties in the collaboration. And in companies, maybe there is opportunities for the research team to come in to present their research or you know, present at webinars that are open to external audience as well. So uh, to summarize, I think always be proactive in growing the relationship and make it very mutually uh, rewarding is, is the key. So I think this brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you uh, so much for joining us and uh, we're happy to take any questions. Yeah, and if we don't get to everybody's questions uh, during the session, our emails are on the screen, although the screen will stop sharing in a second, uh, but we've uploaded a, a copy of the slides and you can find our details at the, at the end of that. So the slides are in the general chat if you wanna download those as well. So we'll stop sharing now. We'll see if there's any questions that anybody wants to, um, ask us oh wow there's lots of questions <laughs> um okay just having a quick look through just to see if there's so thank you everybody who said thank you um a sample dashboard with you um if you send us an email we might be able to send you an example of what we did there yeah um Okay, just looking through. I think I think it was mainly just comments that came through. Um, but if I missed any any Q and A, uh, feel free to just re-enter it into the into the chat box. I'm happy to uh, 
Oh, here we go. So Q&A. So do you have a browser sandbox that you would recommend to test links in a safe environment? Um, so usually, uh, if this is in regards to um, uh, testing phishing emails, real phishing emails that might come through in your organization, usually you'd build a, um, a completely sectioned off uh, phishing environment uh, or environment that you can essentially detonate at the end. In terms of uh, a browser sandbox, I don't know of any browser sandboxes, but in the past, for example, I've just used separate, um, you know, virtual machine set up specifically for this purpose, um, where we'd go through and um, have it connected to a uh, completely separate network connection, so it wasn't connected to our network in any way, um, and that way there was no way it could uh, sort of float outside of um, the virtualized environment. Um, what will be the proper information that should be in the security website for all staff, keeping in mind their different levels of knowledge about security according to the role of each person? Um, I think in the design of our program, um, what we did for phishing simulations or phishing awareness, for example, is we used the first 12 months of phishing simulations to design a baseline and, um, and get an understanding because, like you say, each, not only will each individual have different knowledge, but each organization will have different knowledge as well. So, um, or, or sort of a different baseline in, in their awareness around phishing. So uh, what we did is we used the first 12 months uh, to establish that baseline. So for the first um, sort of uh, two months, we did what we, we came up with a classification model for phishing um, emails. And for the first two months, we did easies, and then we did mediums, and then we did hard. Uh, and then we repeated that process for the following six months just to validate what our thinking, you know, that we were um, baselining it correctly. And what we, the conclusion that we came to at the end of it was, for example, that um, our organization could pretty much all, um, understand easy and medium classified uh, phishing emails, but they, uh, we should really focus on hard um, classified. And we came up with a methodology to define what easy, medium, and hard were. So, for example, easy might have been um, that you have. Um, three visual indicators, whether it be, um, you know, misspelling or the logos all sort of squashy and skew if, for example. So we came up with different um, different elements that defined what each classification model was. So I, think, so I think it's really important to define what the baseline is for your organization and get feedback from your people as well. So for example, in terms of the proper information, um, when you design your security education and awareness programs, you should, um, you know, develop content and then get feedback from all those different, um, um, you know, different stakeholders in different business units as well. Is this too easy for you? Know, you know, draft it. Um, one campaign that I've gone through before, we we drafted everything up. We thought it was fabulous, you know, all this sort of thing, and then we found, you know, people hated it. <laughs> so, you know. Um, it's, it's really important to get early feedback on whatever you're developing from different stakeholder business groups um, to make sure that, um, I mean, and you'll always get negative feedback about certain things, but if the majority um, is positive, then, um, you know, you know you're on a winner. Uh, so Yenny, this one might be for you. You mentioned you need lots of data. How much data would you need for this kind of analysis? Would a phishing simulation as a service be able to use this and provide insights across clients? Before I answer the question, I just want to check if we still have time to answer the question. Oh, I if think you're on. We can chat later in a in a separate room as well. I think Valdemar might have, be having some technical yeah. <laughs> audio, audio issues. <laughs> okay, maybe just go Yeti and, and we'll yeah, get yeah. as much as we can. <laughs> so I guess um, in terms of, oh, no. Nope. <laughs> He's saying time, time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so I think it's Sume. Um, Sume, if you want to find us on the floor or, or shoot us an email, we'll be happy to, to answer yeah. your question. Um, but thank you very much, everybody. Um, apologies if we didn't get to your question, but like I said, if you want to shoot us an email, we're always happy to um, provide um, some answers to anything we didn't get to. Yeah, thank you so much.